Hi everyone, it's your co-host Michael Sean Breeden here, and I wanted to let everyone in the New York City area know that if you are in town, you should be checking out the groundbreaking Complexions Contemporary Ballet as it celebrates its 29th season under the direction of co-founding artistic directors Dwight Roden and Desmond Richardson. The program at the Joyce Theater includes works by Ricardo Amarante, Jen Freeman, and a company premiere of Justin Peck's The Dreamers, staged by yours truly. Additionally, a premiere by Complexion's principal choreographer Dwight Roden set to the raw acoustic music of U2 is sure to thrill audiences. So if you're around between November 14th and the 26th, please don't hesitate to book your tickets at Joyce.org. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. On today's episode of Conversations on Dance, we are joined by internationally renowned choreographer Lar Lubavitch. We talk to Lar about his late start in dance, the benefits of creating works on his own company, and the differences in the creative process for the dozens of commissions he received over decades, whether for the most respected ballet companies in the world, musical theater, or even ice dancing. If you're in the New York area, come celebrate Lar's career this December 3rd at the Guggenheim Works in Process presentation, Lar Lubavitch at 80, Art of the Duet which will feature duets Lar choreographed throughout his career. Tickets are available at guggenheim.org slash initiatives slash works dash process. Lar, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, there's so much to talk about. And of course, we want to um, get a little bit of background on you um, to get a wider view of what brought you into the dance world to begin with. So maybe we could just hear um, a story about how you got the sort of dance bug. What what made you want to come into dance to begin with? Oh, gosh, you're asking me to go back to the dark ages. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Right from the beginning. I actually danced as a child, just uh, intuitively, just spontaneously, whenever there's music playing. And I started at a very, very early age. And um, I got nicknamed the dancer as a kid. And uh, I really didn't know a profession existed that uh, that called for that particular idiosyncrasy. And so Mm -hmm. I was in college at the University of Iowa, where I was an art major and a gymnast. And I saw a dance company for for the first time, actually. It was uh, the Jose Limon Company. And uh, when I saw it, it was uh, had the feel of a revelation that there was what I was meant to do. Mm-hmm. So I was thunderstruck and pretty much changed my life from that moment forward. Mm-hmm. Where did you grow up then? Did you grow up in Iowa or um, did you were you just attending university there? In Chicago. Mm-hmm. In Chicago. OK. Mm-hmm. And I had so a- you hadn't had any um, you didn't have any. Um, interaction or experience with uh, uh, seeing a, a dance performance until that moment at University of Iowa. Oh, that's right. I really didn't. Uh, I came from a, a family of basically hardworking people who weren't very exposed to the arts or um, mm-hmm. or inclined to, you know, to guide us towards it. Mm-hmm. And then right. from there, what was the next steps for you? You found that there is a way that you can pursue this professionally. What was the next steps that you took to really get going on that path? Uh, well, uh, just to back up a little bit, I, as a gymnast, uh, uh, a woman came to watch the team working out and uh, asked if anyone was interested in dancing. This was mm-hmm. actually before the Lamont Company. And I was always interested in dancing. I didn't know exactly what it meant, but I said, sure, me, take me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she actually was uh, in my modern dance and she was teaching modern dance and so I began working with her and realizing what dance was and then she took me to see this performance Mm -hmm. Uh, we went backstage after the performance of the Limon Company to ask what I could do you know to pursue this and I was advised to go to uh, a summer dance program which was uh, at that time called the American Dance Festival in Connecticut College it still exists to this time it's a huge important dance program in the summer and uh Durham, North Carolina now. But uh, I did go there to find out more seriously what dance was. And uh, from there, they told me I could audition in New York for the Juilliard School. And I'd been in college for one year, so I was interested in continuing uh, my college education. Mm-hmm. And so I auditioned with Juilliard and was accepted. And uh, that began the the serious part of being a real dancer. Mm-hmm. Did you then have an idea? Obviously, that's a pretty 
quick turnaround from being, you know, obviously physically active, but not a dancer. And then to be getting accepted into Juilliard, which is a hugely prestigious program. Did you have an idea then that you were talented or were you just kind of going along this path that without really thinking or overthinking rather? I, I don't think the word talented was in my mind. I, I, I wouldn't have known how to answer that question if it was asked. It was just something that I did that I was clearly uh, adept at and enjoyed on a very deep level. It was a very freeing thing. And um, and so I just walked towards whatever path opened that took me there. But uh, I, I didn't have any idea yet what talent meant or mm -hmm. at what level I would be working. Uh, it, it turns out I was um, quite natural and, and took to the more serious aspects of dance and dance training very easily with gymnastics training behind me. I was wondering right. how that kind of helped you um, once you got into formal training classes. I mean, there's people in there that are talking about the names of the steps that you aren't familiar with yet, that, that sort of thing, and the structure of class you're not familiar with. How did that background in gymnastics really help you to kind of catch yourself up to speed? Well, I was physically fit and, right. and, and, and ready to, to attempt to do those things. And when I began dancing, I was just copying um, people around me. What they did, I did. It was it was all a process of discovery, really. I knew so little about it, which uh, many years later I was grateful for because uh, I carried no preconceived notions into dance or choreography. So that was kind of right. free to invent in, in my own way without mm -hmm. having been um, inflected upon by information. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I, was, I was choreographing from the time I was three or four years old. Right. Um, when I saw a dance company the first time, what I realized is that I was a choreographer. Mm, and I decided right. I didn't have to be a dancer for a number of years first to find out what that was and so that I could pursue choreography. But my intent right from the get-go was to choreograph. It was art and movement put together, art and gymnastics. Mm. I did right. best most. So it, it seemed very clear to me that was my destiny. We spoke right. about I think destiny when we were at that time. Right. I, I think that that's super interesting that you're the way you pinpointed that the lack of preconceived notion about what choreography should be or like your own judgments in that way aided you in becoming a choreographer. I guess I, I think my own background, I went to the School of American Ballet for years and you have Balanchine on a pedestal. So it actually, for me, it discouraged me from even I was like, well, well, you know, what do I have to offer? This is, this is genius. <laughs> so for you, you know, for you, like you were kind of untethered to that sort of, um, I guess maybe self judgment, you know. So, I, um, so you've been. You said you were making dances from the time you were three or four years old. But what were some of the first times that you had um, an opportunity to build work that maybe garnered you attention, or or where you started to realize this was um, something you could do? Uh, well, um, I, I became a dancer first, of course, and and mm -hmm. was. The opportunity to uh, attempt choreography. I really didn't try it while I was at Juilliard mm. uh, or for the first few years that I was in the profession. But then the, the hunger became strong. I was in a dance company, a very good dance company, very good dancers with really, really bad choreography to do, but a company full of extremely uh, advanced artists is the Harkness Ballet. And uh, doing all those bad dances, but watching all those great dancers turn it into something much better than it really was, gave me a real hunger for making dances. Uh, so it's when I was in the Harkness Ballet, which was in 1968. I, she was there from 1965. Uh, in 1968, I decided to take a leave of absence and present a concert, uh, which is kind of the way we people did it in those days. They just sort of right. debuted by creating something and opening the door and see who would come to see it. The dance world was much uh, less stretched uh, it was much broad, m much less broad world at that time, and uh, mm -hmm. um, the dance explosion had not happened yet. This was just a few years before it, so I right. did that. I got a theater and saved my money and put on three dances, and that that launched it. And it uh, it received a great deal of attention right away. Hmm. Had you gotten a chance to flex your choreographic muscles at Juilliard at all? Was that part of um, some of your curriculum there? Uh, as, as a student, yes. I mean, I had a class with uh, Anthony Tudor, who to this time I consider 
one of my most, absolute most potent influences mm-hmm. and that was, whose relationship to music and time and space is very much um, a, a part of my own work. And I also had choreography with Anna Sokolow, uh, you know, who did very tortured, dramatic, <laughs> uh, character-driven work. So in classes with them, of course, we did studies and exercises. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. According to your um, bio, you took some classes with very iconic people at Juilliard. Um, Martha Graham, you already mentioned um, Tudor and Lamone. Tell us just a little bit what that was like having all of these iconic. And and when you're young, too, I feel like sometimes you're not quite aware yet of maybe who these people are. Did that was that a, something you understood? What was this like at this time for you? In actual fact, my very first dance class ever was with Martha Graham. And <laughs> I didn't know it. I didn't know who she was. I, right. I had no I had no baggage whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said, I, I'd gone to this American Dance Festival on the advice of dancers that I had seen in the Lamone Company. And um, my very first class at 9 a.m., uh, a woman in a black kimono walked in with sort of inky black hair and um, a very erect spine and she said and and the whole class started doing these exercises and I just stood, sat in the back and copied them and got along and I, I, I slowly found out as the summer progressed you know, with, with whom I was learning and that it was Martha Graham my second class was with Jose Limon and after lunch hmm. my third class was with Alvin Ailey oh my gosh <laughs> My first day and my first teachers. And that, as wow. strange as that is, that's really what happened. It seems mythic now, but it actually went that way. That's wow. bonkers. Wow. So were, like, was your level of fitness from being a gymnast enough to kind of get you through that? I'm thinking like those must have been three pretty brutal classes and having like, this is my first day of dance. And I just have three ballet or three dance classes <laughs> that are you know, with these giants, but I mean, that, that would be hard on a body. Like think we think about like dancers when you have a layoff and you come back, but you've been conditioning for your whole life. It still hurts. So for you, for your first day, having that many classes and with these giants of dance, were you physically adept at handling that? I was physically adept at copying and (laughs) and what I saw. And, uh, within very little time, my body ached in a way it had never ached before. And it actually hasn't stopped. (laughs) <laughs> yeah don't we know uh, it it's yeah. good no, yeah except the level of discomfort in exchange for doing what you believe in and that's just part of the deal yeah so how right. do you feel and this might be something that you could only answer like maybe a little bit later in your career but i wonder how working with these giants in influenced you and your choreography specifically um just having them near you learning all these different techniques and then but also like michael was like you guys were talking about earlier just being kind of untethered to anything specific when you started uh well the first things i saw of course had the most impact and and in a little while after being there, it was a Martha Graham company. At the end of each week, a major dance company would perform. Uh, and Martha Graham was early on. And I really realized mm-hmm. uh, uh, with whom I was in the room. And um, one dance in particular moved me incredibly primitive mysteries, which is a very early dance of hers, a very, very simple, um, very profoundly simple piece with a great emotional tension to it. It had a huge impact on me. And then everybody I saw Consequently, um, the Jose Limon Company, of course, again, and some other companies, budding companies, the Alvin Ailey Company. I saw one of the first mm-hmm. performances of Revelations, actually, that summer. Wow. At the Dance Festival and a few others. And, and of course, those had an enorm- enormous impact. Oh, I bet. Right. Can you tell us a, a little bit about what the, these first dances, like when you put together your first concert, um, Evening of Dance, uh, what were the... What kind of defined these works? What were you trying to to say in your first, in your choreographic debut? I think I was say, look at me, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked, apparently. <laughs> I was accused by someone early on of having the ability to attract attention. And, wow. and I mean accused, but it was, it was a veiled kind of sort of a, a damning praise, you know, this 
and that this person said that to me and it was that borderline was that it's a little shady <laughs> Dick, yeah <laughs> well so from there how did opportunities continue to build for you in that arena very quickly uh, i did that first concert i did three dances um i didn't know what i was doing but i uh, i mean in the sense of really having any uh plan of action that anything behind it except just intuitively charging forward and making and making and making mm. and seeing what came out. But I was immediately invited to uh, create dances on other companies. Six months later, I went to Israel to make a dance for the Backdoor Dance Company, which was a sister company, the Batsheva Dance Company. Mm. Uh-huh. And a month after that, I was in Lisbon, Portugal, doing a dance for the Gulbenkian Ballet. Uh, I, I had worked with the director of the company in the Harkness Ballet. He was a choreographer and he came to see my concert and then invited me there. So things took off very quickly. Wow. Did you ever yeah. feel at that time, like, how am I going to put out enough material? I always wonder that about choreographers. You have all these projects coming up and it's, were you ever worried? Like, will I have enough inspiration? Will I have a way to create this much work? Uh, well, of course. I mean, when you, when you make something out of nothing, you, you start in a pretty dark place. There's no light, light on whatsoever. And the first idea mm-hmm. is to create a little glow. And then you begin to see the space and can begin to sort of build on that first idea. But of course, anybody who creates will tell you that fear is a very powerful energy. And it can either work against you or work for you, but it is just an energy. And uh, mm-hmm. if, you, if you can use it as a catalyst, it can be quite helpful. Oh, I love that. Right. Maybe, could we hear a little bit about your your personal process? So, um, like, for instance, you well, at this point, you're getting so many commissions and things are moving pretty quickly. Do you have, like, a sort of um, catalog of music you, you want to choreograph to eventually, like, that maybe you'll get to down the line? How How do you decide where you're going to start basically like like let's say at that age when you know you get the commission in portugal where you're just like oh i've been thinking about this piece of music and i need x dancers or how do you kind of um negotiate what the piece is going to be like well music really is where i have always begun and that started very early on when i was uh very young and just sort of dancing around uh, for no reason at all i was much more serious about being an artist and i was painting and drawing and I spent a good deal of time making art as a kid and I always had music playing and so I was always sort of making art to music and I had a Mm -hmm. a lot of music stored in my head by the time I became a choreographer music I had just latched on to as as a as an accompaniment to painting and um, Mm -hmm. so I had a lot of music stored up all sorts of music and right from the beginning I was working wide range from classical to ethnic to um, pop or jazz I had no mm-hmm. particular uh, specific kind of music. I, I think I said at that time that I, and I think that from truth still, it had to be music that made me want to dance. Mm-hmm. Now, kids these days can just discover music on Spotify or on their phones. And it's like really easy to kind of search through and find something. What was your process like for finding these things that you were listening to while you were painting? Was it just around the house? Did you go out and search for things? How did that come about for you? Well, it was really just on the radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I became a choreographer and to find music, and at that time it was a much more difficult process. Uh, right. What people have with their hands now is is a, a, an incredible blessing, considering what we have to go have to go through. I would hang out for hours at record stores, listening to music, and there used to be little booths that they'd put you in, and you could request hearing music. And if I found a composer whose sound I liked. And I let's do as much of that composer's music as I could until I found one piece that mm. seemed to capture my interest in its entirety. Mm. It's a different process, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So at what point did you feel like uh, starting your own company was really the logical step for continuing your own um, artistic development? Uh, Well, I think that uh, I felt at the beginning that the only way to find my real voice was to have my own company and to not work for Mm -hmm. other people. I had the opportunity Mm -hmm. to work for other people all the way along the way, but but my heart was really in a group of dancers uh, of my own choice who were there for the same reason, to develop work together. And uh, I, I felt pretty strongly that 
I don't know what the thinking is about about it now, but somewhere along the line when I was beginning, it was sort of tacitly understood that you had to find your own voice if you're an artist and you had to be true to that voice. And uh, and so I was kind of dedicated to doing that right from the get-go. And I thought I could only do that if I had a group of dancers with me developing in the same um, tempo and in the same direction. I wonder so, how your choreography ended up being different working with your dancers that you knew very well as opposed to the things that you were going out and doing with other companies as a guest. Uh, well, quite different because once I had a group of dancers that were working closely with me, it turns out it was a way of dancing that that was coming out of me. It was a way of feeling about movement, a way of, of playing music on my body that was quite individual. And in time, the dancers I worked with adapted to and understood how to play the music on their bodies in the same way. When you work with a company of strangers, you spend half the time teaching them how to dance. So it's, right. It's, it's a much more challenging process. And I don't think I ever did my best work on other companies. And I think that I did as well as I could. And after a while, uh, I realized it was better simply to take existing work and set it on the companies rather than trying to create them from scratch. I did both, but, right. but in the long run, it was better to work with my own. Try Audible Plus free for 30 days. Audible Plus is a brand new all-you-can-listen membership that offers access to thousands of titles, including a vast variety of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals that span genres, lengths, and formats. Access Audible originals, including documentaries, theater, and sleep programs, all made to be heard. Plus, audiobooks, including fan favorites and most loved genres like mystery and thrillers and motivation. Audible Plus also allows you to tune into podcasts like Conversations on Dance, an exclusive series ad-free. Get Audible Plus now, free for 30 days and just $7.95 a month after that. Or give the gift of Audible this holiday season. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash shop slash conversations on dance or click the link in the show notes. Right, yeah. Right, so fr from the first seed of an idea of, okay, I, I want to have my own company, what were the, the steps to get that into action? Uh, well, I had dancer friends looking for places to dance. There weren't that many places to dance in. Um, and there were a lot of young dancers that um, needed work. And we just sort of gravitated towards each other and became a company. Mm -hmm. They were all mm -hmm. my own age, uh, of a similar dance experience. Uh, I was always studying modern, several modern and classical at the same time. Um, plus enjoying ethnic dance studies as well. And um, people who had similar interests, we, we sort of gravitated to each other and became a company. Hmm. And then what about the learning curve there for just the admin stuff that has to be done, all the behind the scenes work, the fundraising, all of that? What was that like for you as well? I, impossible. <laughs> and I, I had no, no skill whatsoever and doing that and and no no comfort at all can be found in those things and and so i i was neglectful about those things and then at some point i realized that uh, other people can do that for you right yeah <laughs> <laughs> i found people who would do that you know on my behalf and um and they became part of building the company as well right. but i've never been comfortable about that and uh and uh, particularly the fundraising, I've always found it very humiliating to ask for money. Yeah, I understand. That would be the hardest part for uh, me, for sure. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> never never want to do that. <laughs> no, never no. in a million years. Um, but, you know, you, of course, it makes sense that you are in your element with your own dancers and, and developing and growing together. But just looking at your resume, it, you just certainly didn't shy away from working with other companies. And it's a very impressive list um new york city ballet american ballet theater royal danish ballet paris opera stuttgart netherlands dance theater ailey i mean this is just kind of um i don't know anyone else who has your <laughs> resume actually that's <laughs> wildly impressive so um what ways were you making it work with these dancers i know you have to kind of like come up to speed with everyone and like get on the same page and that is time consuming but um how did you find a, a groove that would work with these individual iconic companies um so so little, little of it is a result of having thought it through uh, mm -hmm. it's it's much more the willingness 
I, I, I dare say courage to put yourself in an impossible situation and see if you can manage it. And, mm-hmm. and the tension, the pressure, the, uh, the inspiration as well. Um, uh, something has to happen. And, and, um, the result of all that tension is there's a release and, and the release becomes whatever dance is possible under those circumstances. Mm-hmm. But it's not a process that's thought through in any detailed or thorough way. I, I know it sounds disingenuous to say that I've never really known what I was doing, but, but I stand by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I myself in a situation in which I have to act and, and I accept the, the, uh, the tension that goes with it and use the tension to find release. I'm curious how the um, style of the dancers dancing at different companies um, also influenced you just to use um, examples from that list that Michael read New York city ballet versus American ballet theater. They have different trainings. How did that um, inspire you maybe like work with them and how did that maybe change the outcome of what you created? Uh, Well, I certainly, uh, felt a need to move in their direction. I could never get them to dance this particular way that I had been concentrating on. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was interested in seeing how it could look differently in their version than the one I had anticipated and um, tried to be as generous as possible in allowing that to happen. Uh, Sometimes it's as much a way of dancing for dancers and other companies as a way of making a dance. You mentioned New York City Ballet, and they were used to balancing. Right. And he had a certain way of making a dance, a certain process, and um, and a certain look when that dance was finished. And uh, working with those dancers, with what they bring to the room, it becomes, um, one feels compelled to try to work their way as well as mm-hmm. to dance their way. Mm-hmm. So dances came out differently than they would have come out had I not been with them. Um, yeah. I'm best judge of whether they were the best dancers. I've often felt they weren't, but, but no, I'm hard on myself. So. <laughs> I wonder if you, cause then you mentioned that you kind of decided like maybe in the future when you got, um, you know, when companies wanted to work with you, you wanted to bring existing works there. So what was that? Like, would you send a repetitor on your behalf? Were you going to also coach? What did that start to look like once you started to shift into sending, um, commissioning some of your current works? Yeah, I always went myself because I was very interested in and in wanted to be a part of it, and uh, and very selfish actually about the <laughs> opportunities to go to different companies in foreign countries. And Should do it. I, I wanted those experiences myself. Insofar as my body was still able to do it, and then later, when I became less able physically, I started taking assistance with me, and now I do send uh, two or three people to stage dances, and then I come in at the end to coach it. Nice. Right. Uh, I'm wondering, since you're saying that you personally thought maybe these works weren't your strongest, and maybe that was owing to you not having the the sort of depth of a connection that you have with, of course, your own dancers. Did you ever take a work that you that say you was commissioned for you elsewhere, and then tinker with it with your own company afterwards, mm-hmm. or was it sort of like, you know, the dances are like dances are like butterflies and all that, you know, let it <laughs> let it go. No, you're right. I did exactly that. I, mm-hmm. I dance back uh, and and do everything I could to enhance it, uh, fulfill it. Right. I I did that any of the dances I did in my own company. I never quite quite left them alone. I was always uh, mm. trying to improve something or get something more right, as I put it, than I had gotten it. It's, it's sort of a, an obsessive thing. Mm. Hmm. I think that that's interesting, though. I think that, like, it's very common for, I mean, it's highly common for choreographers to do that, but it's different from, you know, no, you know, you're not going to go back to a painting that you did mm-hmm. 10 years ago and start <laughs> start messing around with it. Like, what is what is that like to have your your work just being this kind of living, breathing thing that you can you can continually alter? Uh, well, dance is like that. It, it for better or for worse, it, it only exists when it's happening. It's totally amorphous. It has no finished shape. It has no final look because it'll be different every single time. You change one dancer, you change the size of the stage, a different lighting designer, what have you. It's going to be a somewhat altered experience each time. 
That's a better word because, it, as I say, it, it doesn't exist except when it's happening, which, of course, we all mm -hmm. know very well. And so you have the, the freedom to keep shaping it, but not the ownership of a finished product. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your foray into musical theater that started with um, Into the Woods. Can you tell us a little bit about how that opportunity came about? The uh, writer of Into the Woods, uh, writer-director James Lapine, uh, was a fan of dance. And uh, he knew dance quite well. And, and he had seen a performance of mine at City Center, I believe. And they were casting about for a choreographer for the musical Into the Woods. And I sent got a phone call to meet with him one day. And uh, that's how it began. Wow. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like for you then? I it seemed, I imagine you're so level-headed. I imagine that even going into something that is, you know, a different world, that you're just very pragmatic about it. But it, it is, there are highly different parameters in that sphere from, okay, you enter the studio with your own dancers and you can just create. So what were, what was that like kind of um, adjusting to this new world? Uh, in, in a way, very liberating because um, because I, the buck didn't stop here. Uh -huh. There was the director's vision, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. his job was to make a dance that he would make if he could make a dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. Gave a totally different motivation and drawing from a totally other source, and uh, I, I love doing that. It was very liberating, not only because it was not my idea that had to be. Um, uh, brought into fruition, but to go in someone else's head and, and find out their thinking and 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 create for them about their work. Uh, I mm -hmm. love doing it. I always have loved doing that. Hmm. I feel like that's a right. very dancer answer because then the director then gives you notes, right? And feedback on the choreography, which you probably never really get otherwise, right? It's like you say, you're the one in the front of the room, you're making the decisions. Absolutely. I mean, it's so opposite because in fact, very early on, uh, I would never let people critique my work. If I had showings and someone said, can I tell you something? I said, no. No, thank you. Uh. <laughs> I thought you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this was all in the spirit of, of finding my voice, sticking my voice, mm -hmm. bad or good, and, and, and not letting it be altered or shaped by opinions. Yeah. But totally different. Uh, and James Lapine is very particular. and to the point where he really didn't know what he wanted to see until he saw it. So I would have to do a dance sequence or a moving sequence over and over and over till, mm -hmm. till it struck a chord in his imagination. Hmm. This is a kind of a, it's not off course, but it is, I think it's a sweet story that's reminded me of talking about Into the Woods, reminded me of um, our close uh, a, a teacher of ours Susie Pilar was married is married to Chip Zion who's the original baker she danced for Balanchine and she he, she's she said that he would come home like panicked about the steps and they would rehearse them in the apartment together Aww. but that there, I remember her saying like that about changes you know like well Chip you know the thing he was most nervous about is like the dancing because that's not in his wheelhouse oh that's very funny I never heard that before and I didn't know it was married to Susan Pilar Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love hearing that. <laughs> it's so fun. I know when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is so fun. Such a nice connection. <laughs> it's just his game. He would, he, would, he would try it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. dance, really. It was musical staging, which is a little different than dance. Right. Because um, it's, it's for non-dancers, but finding the way for them to move to illustrate the music that made them comfortable and also satisfied the needs of the... Uh, the director's vision. Right, yeah. right. Can we talk a little bit about your foray into choreographing for ice dancing? So it's, it sounds like you're just game. You're speaking of people being game. You are game. You're 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 just trying to kind of um, experience every, all that there is, like, and, and just have another tool in your choreographic kit. And I think that's so so brave and interesting. But what what even inspired you to kind of delve into that? You know, looking back on it, and you speak of my resume, it all looks so strategic and so planned. <laughs> but but mm -hmm. really, much of it was so arbitrary, and we all have far less control than we think about mm -hmm. how our lives go, even on a daily basis. And I 
really let it take me. And if somebody asked me to work, I worked. I, I almost never said no because I was interested in stretching and testing and experiencing different things. And similarly to the way um, I got into the woods, John Curry, uh, Olympic gold medalist in men's uh, ice ice uh, skating uh, from Britain, had formed a ice skating dance company. And he was interested in stretching ice skating into a more artistic form. And he came and got me. He had seen my work and he thought it, it looked as though it had a relationship to ice skating. And my work has been described as very curvaceous and um, lyrical. And that seemed to suit uh, the other medium. And so John Curry asked me to make a piece for his company. And that started a, a series of ice pieces that I made for soloists, for Olympic skaters, as well as a couple of full length. I stand specials for television. Wow. And so how, what was the learning curve like there? It's kind of like at the beginning for you where you're just kind of seeing steps that are already in existence and then putting your own spin on it and not being tethered to anything specific. What was that like to kind of, that's just such a different art form. Well, uh, the curious thing about ice skating is there are only about seven or eight steps. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and almost anything you do is an invention on ice mm -hmm. if you're not working mm -hmm. in the framework of competitive ice skating that requires these elements right uh, so it was a chance to to invent you knowing a form that had not not had that much invention applied to it and and everything else it was just a chance to put myself in a situation to see what came out mm -hmm. uh, to see what could happen That's and uh, right and also a chance to relieve myself of the rules of dance I had acquired up to that point, my own company and the, the burden of having my own company and uh, making dances for them, uh, just to be in another world. Uh, each time I ventured elsewhere, though, whether it was Broadway or ice skating, I was wound up so glad to be back in the dance world. Mm. <laughs> There's something about dancers, unlike people in other professions, that is unique and rare. There's an innocence uh, there's um, a commonality. There's there's a, a, a shared um, devotion to something. Uh, a to say it's religious, and it isn't religious, but it always has that kind of fervor. Mm -hmm. And right. um, there's um, a camaraderie. There, there's a, a goodness. So true. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm wondering if you could maybe just speak to. But I guess the arc of your choreographic career a little bit more, um, just how, how you feel you have changed as an artist and maybe what is also still fundamentally the same from that first concert that you put on. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've acquired a uh, technique. I, I acquired a lot of information about making a dance according to my own uh, way of making a dance. So that when I, in later times, when we would make a dance, I had information in advance, more or less about how to go about it. It wasn't as deeply stabbing in the dark as it was at the beginning. But uh, I always tried to dispel that information so that I could start from zero. Um, there's a, a quality of not knowing, uh, which is a broader state of mind than knowing. Uh, I know a few things. I know a number of things, but what I don't know is much, much broader. So I always try to get into this I don't know how mind, even though it's a trick, uh, so that I can dispense with all that acquired information and 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 start from zero. Let's talk about um, the upcoming performances uh, for Works in Process on December 3rd, where there will be a series of duets um, in honor of your 80th birthday. Tell us a little bit about what this program will be like and how you both chose what duets will be shown and the dancers who will be involved. Uh, well, it, it turns out that I uh, have been very adept at making duets. Uh, again, it wasn't by, by intent, but it just as as a result of what I've done, a great many duets have arisen, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I I enjoy doing duets. I I, uh, I like the parameters of of forearms, four legs, and everything you can do with it. <laughs> and torsos. Uh, group work is the most difficult, the most challenging, the most threatening. But two people in a room together, you can uh, really 
focus three minds in on something very special. And and duets, anyway, you know, in the history of dance, it's almost always the duet that centers the moment of a dance. When everything, mm-hmm. uh, everyone else leaves the stage and two people are left and they're about to make a statement together, it, it really captures the attention, the imagination of everyone in the audience. There's something about uniting two souls that everybody in their heart of hearts wants to see happen. Uh, you know, it's 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 it, it it speaks to everyone's journey in life when those two people come together to make a statement as one. And uh, it turns out they made a lot of duets. Mm-hmm. So when um, the works of process um, directors uh, Duke Dang and Carol Cronson approached me to the program, I suggested a duet program because um, uh, there seemed to be. Uh, uh, a lot of dancers around who knew duets of mine. It's it seemed available, mm-hmm. having done so many. Well, and it's maybe a fun way to get lots of dancers involved, right? There's many coming and from different places, as we understand, correct? Yes, uh, we have um, uh, two dancers from New York City Ballet that I've been working with, Adrian Dancing Waring and Joseph Gordon, two spectacular dancers uh, that I've choreographed a dance on. That was at uh, Fall for Dance two seasons ago, um, and. Uh, Dancers from my own company, two dan- a dancer from San Francisco Ballet, Juan Montan, a very wonderful, magical dancer, mm-hmm. dancing mm-hmm. principal of the Joffrey Ballet, uh, doing a, a duet from Othello, which was a big piece I did for Mecham Ballet Theater. Uh, and uh, two dancers from Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, uh, learning a dance that I had done in that company some years ago. And a couple of dancers from Dallas, Texas, with the company I work with currently. Uh, called Bruce Wood Dance, uh, uh, an offshoot company made by a dancer who worked with me for many years. Mm, great. How do you how do you select repertoire though? Um, like even I guess it goes back to your first concert as well. Like how how do you find balance within a program when you're when you are selecting your own works um, to show an array of your own talents, of course, but also to give the audience like a sort of arc for an evening. I actually base it on the music. And 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 you're quite right. There is an arc that's being sought and, and constructed, and and for me that arc really concerns the music, and uh, how how to uh, how to make each piece uh, take us on the next step of the journey. Mm-hmm. And each music will elicit a different physical response. So so just by vent of music being different, the dance will also be different. Right. I imagine that this evening is going to be very special for you to have all these dancers come together. What does it mean to have this program um, as a part of Works in Process? Um, well, uh, oh gosh, uh, it's humbling. Um, I I think probably one of the most uh, privileged things I've enjoyed is that dancers seem to love to do my work. And uh, that has been a great deal to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that probably is is the underlying theme of this, all these dancers who've done my work that that really share with me the enjoyment of making the work and doing the work, but that dancers enjoy being in my work, they love to do my work, that's very meaningful to me. Oh, I bet, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so beautiful. Um, so obviously you always stay busy. What What's next in the pipeline for you? <laughs> well, I'm choreographing much less uh, and... Um, trying to create up only where there's an opportunity to do something I really want to do or that I haven't done. Um, and um, I'm teaching much more. I have a, I'm at the University of California in Irvine with a very fancy title as Distinguished Professor. And um, Great. I'm there for several weeks at a time each year, not full time, and um, staging my dances for the students as well. And then choreographing as the opportunities arise. I don't think the idea of, I don't think the idea shifted that much. That if anybody asks me, pretty much I'll do it. <laughs> You're always game. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so wonderful to chat with you. And we hope that everyone will come out to see that great program um, for Works in Process. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lar. Conversations on Dance is part of the ACAST Creator Network. 
For more information, visit conversationsondancepod.com.